I hope so. I started it again. Yeah, it's something like that. I mean, we'll see. It's kind of complicated and weird. So wait, did it record before or not? Is it recording now? It's recording now. So. OK, I guess I'll find out what recording I have when we <laughs> I don't know. Um, I really think about toast. Wait, sorry, what were they saying? I was just using that as an example of an, an idea of a toast versus an impression of toast. Yeah. And you can choose whether you're thinking about an idea. Oh, oh right. It's there, you have an impression. Yeah. I mean, so like that's the basic story. That's the way Barclay puts it, right? Like I can, I can have whatever I, you know, I mean, although he doesn't use this terminology, this is Hume's decision to do this, although I'm sure he had good reasons for it, is just really annoying in terms of this course, because I have to keep, right, like what he calls an idea is not what they call an idea. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so yeah, Barclay says, I can have whichever of these I want, but these don't depend on my will. They depend, and according to Barclay, they depend on the divine will. Um, so, I mean, Hume is going to like allude to a principle like that when he discusses the nature of belief. The nature of belief. But um, because you can't decide what to believe. Um, so that is whether you believe something or not doesn't depend on your will. That's the way it's going to come in. But um, but it's a little it's a little weird because in other places he clearly makes the I mean almost the same place actually he 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 like emphasizes the point that our control over our ideas is limited right like we can't always think about what we want to and not think about what we don't want to um, yes. Yeah. He uses force in terms of like oppression, but he also, in that kind of implies a spectrum, but he also used that in terms of how much we control our thoughts. Because as we know, like those like monks that like they have like the ultra zen way where they can do whatever they want. Right? Uh, all right. Well, I don't know about those monks, and, and neither did Hume, but um, <laughs> um, so actually, remember, I just erased Thomas Brown. One of Thomas Brown's, in, in, in a sense, no, I guess it's not his only big idea, but one of his big ideas that he keeps coming back to is that it doesn't make sense to say that I desire or choose to have a certain idea, because how would that work? Like, so if I, like, if I desire to have toast, I first have the idea of toast, and then I use that to guide my actions to make toast. But if I want to have the idea of toast, it seems like I must already have the idea of toast. <laughs> you can't have the, you can't, like I said, you can't choose to be ignorant because if you know something, you first don't believe you can't be ignorant. So the only thing you can choose to be ignorant to your details. Like you can't, you can't be, you don't need to be ignorant to your details in the sense like, you know there are homeless people, but you don't know how many homeless people there are. Right, or like you know, there are unknown unknowns. Those are the things that you're totally ignorant to. But the only yeah. things you can choose to be ignorant to are well, the details of that. But this is more like, I mean, so on the negative side, it's like, I mean, the famous example is don't think about elephants, right? And as soon as you get that command, you think about an elephant, and you have to because that otherwise you wouldn't understand the command. Anyway, well, what the answer to that is a good question. The, other than Thomas Brown. No one usually agrees with that, but uh, it's not clear what their answer is. <laughs> Maybe I, yeah. Does having an idea mean that you could think about it or that you are thinking about it right now? But I mean, but it doesn't matter. It seems like that. To, to, to want toast, it's not enough to be able to have the idea of toast. You have to have it now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I don't have any toast. I would offer you toast, but I don't have it. All right. Um, so, um, maybe I should give another example. Um, but, right, I'm sorry. That, we're, this is not a course about Thomas Brown. Back to, back to Hume. Hume. So Hume assumes that sometimes, it makes sense somehow, sometimes we can choose which ideas to have and which not to have, but not always. Sometimes we really don't want to think about something, but the idea keeps coming back, right? So, um, so that's why this is a little bit weird, but... All right, so getting back to impressions and ideas. So the, like, so to speak, defining difference is this difference in force and vivacity. But then once we have that definition, there's an important thing we're supposed to know about those two types of perceptions, namely the forceful ones and the less forceful ones, which is that um, um, the impressions, and imp an impression always occurs before the corresponding idea. I mean, this is, I mean, it shouldn't be so surprising. It's basically Hume's version of Locke saying that the mind can't make its own simple ideas. Right, that is, it's Hume's version of empiricism. And he's saying that, you know, and again, I think, so he doesn't, Say that straight out here. He has to limit it to the to the simple components, right? That is, you can certainly have an idea of a unicorn, even though you've never had an impression of a unicorn. But you can't have uh, the the idea of the unicorn has to be made up of ideas, which all of which you've previously had similar impressions to. <laughs> that that that. Prepositional phrase got kind of in trouble, but um, right. So, like, uh, um, you know, you can't imagine white unless you've already seen white before. Now, um, how do we know that? So it kind of seems like the evidence is empirical. It kind of seems that way in Locke too, but it's a little weird, right? Since this is supposed to be the doctrine of empiricism. <laughs> um, but right, so these are the arguments Hume offers. The first one is on page 11. Um, to prove this, the two following arguments will I hope be sufficient. First, when we analyze our thoughts or ideas, however compounded or sublime, we, oh, actually, he does say what I said. He, he, the, the, it has to do with the simple ideas. We always find that they resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were copied from a precedent feeling or sentiment. Right, so, I think here, in that place, he's calling, and this is actually kind of important, is calling sensations, feelings, and passion sentiments. I mean, sentiment is definitely a name for a type of impression. It's, I don't know if it's exactly the same as passions. I think it includes passions. I mean, I mean we'll see, this is why this is important. We'll see that it's supposed to include belief. Belief is a certain sentiment. <laughs> so unlike law, yeah. for Hume, senses can be associated with simple ideas and so can passions? Yeah, as I said, no, I mean, so Locke, Locke thinks reflection can be a source of simple ideas. And so, and, and in particular, reflection is the source of the idea of pain and the idea of pleasure. Actually, no, I guess Locke says that pain and pleasure come through both sensation and reflection. Yeah, he usually, like the list, the things he had lists as ideas of reflection are besides those ones that come through all modes like pain and pleasure and being and unity is usually things like perception, uh, you know, memory, right? Like all those 
kind of mental acts. I think Locke, I wondered if this about Locke. I think it's not entirely clear whether he thinks there's a special kind of angerness to anger, right? Or whether anger is just, so like Hobbes or Spinoza, but there's a definition of like, like this in Locke too, will define passions like that, you know, like anger is pain due to harm caused combined with the desire of revenge or something like that, right? So that doesn't leave over anything that like, if you know what pain is and what harm is and what desire is and what revenge is, then you don't have to have ever experienced anger to know what it is. Whereas Hume definitely thinks that. It's actually, and Hume is, I think Descartes agrees with Hume about this, that anger is a kind of analog to a sensation like red or blue. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. Just going back a little bit in terms of impressions coming before ideas. Yeah. If, what do you think you would say about like, say I've never seen an elephant before. Somebody shows me a picture of an elephant, uh, an elephant, right? So I, I have an impression of a picture of an elephant. And I have an idea of right. a real uh, elephant. <laughs> well, if I see a real elephant in the wild, I will know that it is yeah. an elephant, even though I have never had an impression of a real elephant before. You right, know? but I mean, so, but so first of all, uh, what I was saying before, what, in, and what I realized to himself says here in black and white, what I just wrote, just, read is that as in Locke, this doctrine that the impression has to come before the idea is limited to simple ideas, okay. right? It's the simple components. Sure. Yeah, something like that. So so like, not only could you just see a picture of an elephant, someone could just tell you what it looks like, mm -hmm. right? You wouldn't have to see a picture of it at all. And if they do it well enough, what? Like, I could describe an elephant and you would be able to have an idea of it without having seen it, but you would need to have ideas of bread. Right, and exactly. And right. And, and, and a picture of an elephant really just works the same way, right? Like, I mean, that is, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, if you'd never seen red, I couldn't do the same thing and show you a picture of red. And then when you see red, you would recognize it because the picture already would be red. Right. Like a picture of showing you a picture of red is showing you that. <laughs> it's, it, it the picture of the elephant is like it's there's no real elephant there. It's a terrible picture of an elephant. But <laughs> you don't have to draw anyway. The, <laughs> it's better. The, the, the picture <laughs> it looks more like an hand. I don't know. But the, the picture of the elephant, there's no real elephant there, but there's real gray. Yeah. Right. And that's what's giving you the idea. So, I mean, so if you've never seen gray before, I couldn't tell you what an elephant looks like, but I could show you a picture. And now you would have seen gray. And you, right. So, right. So the, 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 the picture really works on the same principle. Showing you some, some of the simple ideas, and you use them to form the compound idea. Um, um, so that's Hume's first argument for it. That sounds empirical, right? So it's, I mean, we, he says we always find, but that use of the present, the simple present tense is tricky in English. Like, what does that mean? So in this case, I think we always find means so far we've always found. <laughs> Right, like it, right? So, uh, um, there's so that sounds empirical. Like, we could someday notice an exception, and then the second argument is um, this is on page 12. Um, 
if it happened from a defect of the organ that a man is not susceptible of any species of sensation, we always find that he has as little susceptible of the correspondent ideas. And then he goes on to also discuss how a Laplander or Negro has no notion of the relish of wine. This actually, this, there's, there's, I think there's a subtle but telling difference between Locke and Hume on that last point, right? Because Locke always talks about the taste of a pineapple and how Europeans can't know what it is unless they go to where the pineapple is and taste it. Whereas Hume talks about the taste of wine and how the Negroes and the Laplanders can't know what it is. Um, maybe a coincidence, but it is. But he did, but but I mean, it does line up with a difference. But Locke, despite what some people will tell you, is definitely not a racist. Right? Like, pay attention to what he says in the essay. He he always says things like, you know, someone who was born on the Bay of Saldania, if he had been born in England, perhaps would have been a better mathematician than you are. Or, you know, stuff like that. Bay of Saldania, I think, is in South Africa. I'm not confusing it with another example he uses. Anyway, that, um, so uh, that that really doesn't matter. <laughs> but, oh, not not Sudan, Soldania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. But anyway, leaving aside the Laprans and the Negus, like I mean, how do we know this? So first of all, this seems empirical, but what is even the empirical evidence? I mean, I guess the only evidence would be someone who lacked the sense and then got it. And then you ask them, oh, did you ever have an idea of this before? And they said, no. But that's a very limited amount of evidence, if any. I guess, like, yeah, you could get a Laplander and a Negro and give them wine, which of course is what Europeans were very much in the habit of doing, but and then say, oh, did you ever have an idea of this before? But I'm not sure how many, how often that experiment was carried out either. I mean, it's it's. Uh... Okay. Oh, yeah, but that, I mean, so, so first of all, Locke tells the story, I'm spending too much time on this, but oh well. <laughs> what? It's not a mosquito. No. It's another, yeah, I've seen those before. All right. Um, um, Locke tells the story of a blind man he knew who was very learned and spent years trying to figure out what the color red was. And he finally came to him and said, or what scarlet was actually, I guess, or I guess maybe what colors were in general, but his discovery was about scarlet. So he comes, he, he's, you know, he comes very excited and he says, I know, now I know what scarlet is. And he said, what is it? And he said, well, it's like the sound of a trumpet. So there, are, I mean, you might, so Locke is just like, well, this is obviously ridiculous, right? Like a color isn't like a scent. But I mean, I don't know. The blind guy did understand something about scarlet. It is kind of like the sound of a trumpet, right? So, I mean, uh, um, what is the name of that disorder? Um, Synesthesia. Synesthesia. It's not necessarily a disorder, but it's just a weird thing. A yeah. Thing. I mean, I guess maybe if it totally got out of hand, it would be a disorder. But yeah, like some people, I mean, but I feel like we all do that to some extent, or at least I know I do to, to a slight extent, you know, like the different days of the week kind of had different colors. I couldn't say exactly what they are, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, like so, English is blue. Yeah. And math is red and science is green. Yes. Really? I wouldn't have said that. Generally agree on this. Huh. I would totally have said math was blue. But anyway, never mind that. Do you like math? Um, pretty much. All right. Well, it's, uh, so, so it's hard to know where to draw the line between analogies and associations and, you know, and actually like understanding something there. I, 
I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, but I mean, if it's merely an association, then of course Hume can agree that they have that, right? Like if they know red means danger or stop or something like that. Yeah, that so that doesn't involve having the idea of red in the sense that Hume means idea. Right, it's just not just anything true you can say about red or something like that. It has to be a fainter copy of the impression that you get when you see something red. And again, fainter in this weird sense, right? <laughs> Less efficacious. <laughs> Um, so this, this may, this seems kind of weird, right? Like this, the very principle of empiricism is now being given on empirical evidence. Um, but I think it's actually characteristic of Hume. I mean, again, it has to do with that thing about that he can only carry reasoning and justification so far. Um, that he's not claiming that he can start from first principles that no one could doubt and, and base empiricism on that. It kind of just like all goes together. <laughs> um, although, I have to say the weirdest thing about this is that there's one counterexample that Hume considers. Right, right after he discusses the evidence for this, right, th this being that impressions always precede the corresponding ideas, he says, but here's a counterexample. And then it turns out that the counterexample is a thought experiment. It's not empirical at all. <laughs> Right, the, th the counter example is like, suppose someone has been brought up and has seen every shade of blue except one. And now you show them, and he says, by the way, that there, you know, there have to be kind of like least differences in shade. This is exactly similar to what he's going to say about space, that it has to have smallest parts. Um, but it, I mean, but in a case where a lot of the arguments he makes about space might not work. So it might show some kind of like deeper reasons why he thinks there can't be a continuum. Anyway, so, but he says, so, you know, there's like basically there's a finite number of shades of blue and you could have seen all of them except this. One. And then I can show you um, like a spectrum of shades of blue. By shades here, I think he means what we call a hue now, right? It's like the, the, the variable that changes as you go from blue to green to yellow. Right. So we're going from like greenish blue to um, purplish blue, yeah. So we're science to history. So, so we leave one out. And um, and he says that, first of all, the this person would have to notice, you don't actually put a gap here, put them all together, right? So suppose there were only sh three shades of, no, suppose there were only four shades of blue, and they've seen one, two, and four, but not three. So we show them this picture, and Hume says, well, they're going to notice that there's a bigger change between these two than there is between these two. And then he says, and then, then the question is, do we think that they can get an idea of the missing that they've never seen? And he says, I think there are a few who will doubt that they could. Well, what if you argue, <laughs> okay, so he's treating colors as simple ideas. Yeah. What if, I don't know, maybe this isn't about this. What, what if you have simple? I mean, you have simple ideas in front of this, and you can make so. So my idea of blue green is not a simple idea. It's mixing together simple ideas of blue and green, which is what I would be doing here. Yeah. But then there's also like you know different ideas about time and colors. It's just 
Yeah, as long as you for purposes of assembly and purpose of the ideas, right? Yeah, whether it's cyan, yeah, cyan, red, blue, yellow, and I forget what the other one is cyan, magenta, green, cyan, magenta, yellow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, either way, those are the simple ideas. Anyway, I, like, yeah, Hume, Hume definitely doesn't think of, uh, of simple ideas of color along those lines. And whether that would be, I mean, I mean, so like, so it's weird to think of this color of this book, which is kind of tan, as a combination of blue, green, and red. Or, well, but if I try to, maybe he just thinks like, hey, if I try to describe it, I think I would go with yellow, it's an orange. You know, if you took if you took an orange and maybe yeah. yellow or maybe a little bit of green, you would get that. Okay. Yeah, but is that, but you have to learn that empirically. Yeah, same Right, like children have to learn that. I was thinking of the example of a coffee, right? Um, but like, first of all, different cultures have different octaves. <laughs> and then like, from my experience, if you take a note out, people cannot go with it. I mean, some people can, but not all people. Yeah, I you probably can't. can't. If yeah. you see them a scale and you leave one out, there are a lot of people yeah. who do not know what goes to <laughs> Yeah, although there's a lot of weird things about being able to produce the, like I can hear, I can hear a tune in my mind and yet not be able to make it. <laughs> I think if I were like if I were a trained musician, that wouldn't happen, but to me that happens all the time. <laughs> but or you mean even though you hear it, you can't well cheap reach music makes it a lot quicker, but no, but I'm talking about, well, okay, we're wasting time here. I should go on with Hume. All right, because Hume doesn't mention any of those things. So, I, I, I mean, Hume does think, Hume thinks the differences in hue are differences between different simple ideas. Um, differences in uh, saturation, I think he thinks are the differences in degree of the same idea. So it's more, this is more similar to that. But in any case, um, uh, so that's weird because like in the one place where he says, oh, but there is an exception, all of a sudden, rather than being empirical, the exception is a priori. <laughs> um, okay, I don't know exactly what to say about that, but um, uh, now I'm not gonna have enough time to talk about skepticism of matters of fact. I better talk about association of ideas at least. <laughs> That's pretty important. Um, and I guess I will talk about skepticism about matters of fact next time. And that probably means once again, I won't really get to talk about the stuff about power the way I should, but oh well. <laughs> so section three, association of ideas. Um, So he starts by saying, it is evident that there is a principle of connection between the different thoughts or ideas of the mind, and that in their appearance to the memory or imagination, they introduce each other with a certain degree of method and regularity. Now, I mean, note at this point, there's no distinction between correct and incorrect order, the way we saw in Locke. Um any reason that one idea comes after another counts as regularity, right? Any pattern. Um, um, and so that's why he can go on to say, um, even in our wildest and most wandering reveries, nay, in our very dreams, we shall find if we reflect that the imagination ran not altogether at adventures, but that there was still, still, I think, 
the word still used to mostly mean always. <laughs> In Locke, I think it usually means always. And now, of course, it means something else, like even now or even so, it can also mean. But I think in Hume, it's kind of in transition between those two. So I'm not sure which he means here. But there was still, I think he means there was always a connection upheld among the different ideas which succeeded each other. So um, um, Right, so the kind of connection there is between ideas and a dream counts as regularity for these purposes. One thing I suggested enough, basically, something like that. I mean, leaving aside, you know, like Freudian theories or whatever that he didn't know about. <laughs> um, um, so we'll see actually, you know, where the, I mean, this actually goes has something to do with this point here, regularity. We'll, we'll see actually that in the treatise, Hume, um, oops, sorry, um, that in the treatise, uh, Hume does draw a distinction between the regular or reasonable order of ideas in empirical thought versus an irregular and unreasonable order. So, I mean, it's not like he doesn't recognize that distinction, but when he says that all our ideas are connected by a certain principle, he's he's not thinking about that distinction one way or the other. Um, okay, I was gonna talk about the evidence for this again. I mean, I think you you can see, especially in this case, from the way he describes how we how we know this, that it's empirical and that evidence for it has to be built up in the same way we build up any empirical evidence. Um, but I'll just I'll just say that again, like if that, you know, it is evident that there is a principle of connection, really just means it is evident that so far there always has been a principle of connection. If you were to ask, what would it be like for the principle of connection to end, and there'd be no principle of connection, how could we experience that? Um, in, a, in a sense, that's 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 like part of the way to Kant's transcendental deduction. <laughs> but never mind that. So actually, maybe I do have. If I skip that stuff, I do have a little bit of time to talk about skepticism about matters of fact. So the skeptical doubts that he raises here in the first inquiry are skeptical doubts about matters of fact um, beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. Um, so there's, there's two big things here that are being exempted from the doubt. I mean, first of all, the, the distinction that he's, that he's referring to when he talks about matters of fact is the distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. Right? So Hume says all our knowledge is either about relations of ideas or about matters of fact. Now, relations of ideas um, so on the one hand, it's clear from the way he talks about this that, um, I mean, what relations of ideas? This is knowledge that's just based on examining our ideas and seeing the relationship between them. But remember, Locke had a bunch of relations of ideas. What relation of ideas are we talking about here? So he doesn't say here uh, when he introduces this distinction, but I, it becomes clear from what he says later that uh, um, this is always about what Kant would call analytic truths. That is, 
the relation between ideas we're talking about here is basically identity and difference. The, I, the ideas are, you know, like related to each other, either in the sense that one of them contains the other or in the sense that one of them contradicts the other. Right, so like on page 22, in the second part of section four, he says, um, when he's trying to, to show that, that, that we don't know, how do we know that the future will be like the past, basically? And he says, it's evident that there are no demonstrative arguments in the case because it implies no contradiction that the course of nature may change. Right, so in order for it to be demonstrative, that is based on relations of ideas, the opposite of it would have to involve a contradiction. But he also says, and this is one of the things that seems to be a big difference between the first inquiry and the treatise. He says that mathematics, including geometry, is included in this. Like how he thinks that works, I don't know, because like I said, there isn't an extended treatment of geometry in the first anchor. It's just like mentions of it here and there, but you know, like what would be the contradiction in these three angles not equal, equaling two right angles? Locke doesn't think there is one. Right, that's why Locke thinks that, pro pop, that, pro that proposition is not trifling. The opposite of is not a contradiction. But Hume, and on the other hand, in the inquiry, Hume thinks, seems to think that geometry is empirical. I'm sorry, in the treatise, Hume seems to think geometry is empirical, but here he somehow smuggles it in to relations of ideas. So this includes mathematics, if we And But then under, and we're not doubting this, then under matters of fact, we divide it between present sensation or what does he actually say? Present present testimony of our senses. Right, present senses, memory, and other. <laughs> and he's not doubting these. Again, in the treatise, there's going to be a really strong skeptical argument against this. Actually, in the treatise, there's going to be skeptical arguments against this too, against demonstrative knowledge. Um, here, he's only arguing against this. So, um, so that means he's giving us almost every kind of knowledge that Locke says we have. <laughs> right like knowledge as opposed to judgment or opinion Locke says we have in the case of mathematics and we have in the case of present senses and our memory so what are the other things so I mean one thing might be morality which and which in Locke is also connected to proving the existence of God right he doesn't Hume doesn't mention that one way or another here, but Locke's morality is, Locke says that it's demonstrative like mathematics, but that it's not trifling, it's substantial. So we don't know at this point where Hume would put the kind of truth that Locke classifies as moral, which may not be the same as the kind of thing that Hume <laughs> uh, classifies as moral. But in any case, um, but beyond that, what's for sure left out that Locke says we do have knowledge of and Hume is raising doubts about is mechanistic physics. And that's, therefore, that's the example he keeps talking about, right? Like, um, uh, 
or I mean, that's the hard example, right? Like some, like Hume's other examples, like um, bread has always been nourishing in the past, but oh, I'm sorry, you're hungry. I'm talking about bread again, but yeah. all right. <laughs> bread, bread has always been nourishing in the past, but why think that this thing that looks and feels like bread will also be nourishing, right? And I mean, Locke would also say, yeah, that's, we don't know that. <laughs> oh. All right, I, I I don't know what's going to be. Well, I mean, I don't avoid bread. All right, so I guess I do. Anyway, um, uh, but uh, on the other hand, I eat the kind of healthy bread that my mom used to force me to eat when I was young, and I hated it. And now I eat it voluntarily. So what's become of me? Yeah, yeah. I used to call it the rock bread. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to envy my friends who got like white bread. <laughs> anyway. All right. <laughs> Sorry, back a few minutes left. And, and how did that happen? <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> anyway, um, this, so like there, Locke is also going to say, yeah, that's only opinion, right? Because that's about necessary coexistence of the causes of secondary qualities. And Locke says, we don't have knowledge of that. But the case where Locke is going to say we do have knowledge and Hume is going to say we don't is like, if you see one body moving towards another, when it gets there, What's going to happen? So Locke says we know. I mean, I'm not sure Locke thinks we know as much as Hume would claim he thinks we know. I mean, what Locke knows that these bodies thinks we know that these bodies can never occupy the same space. So, I mean, that still leaves several alternatives to what's going to happen. Right. It's not clear that Locke to me that Locke thinks we know that. Um he but he knows what he knows is not gonna happen is that this one's gonna go through this one. <laughs> but whether they're gonna this one's gonna stop and this one's gonna go on, or they're gonna both stop, or they're gonna bounce off each other. I'm not sure if Locke, I mean. You would have to, to think we know something like that to get any actual physics out of it. But he doesn't really give a justification for it. Anyway, so, but, um, so Hume says, yeah, we don't know anything about that except through experience. Um, and, um, well, maybe I shouldn't start with that, but I should say, I should just say, this is included in the matters of fact that, that Hume is going to make, going to raise skeptical doubts about. Um, whereas, yeah, whereas Locke thinks we know this from relation of ideas, but from a, not from this kind of relation of ideas, but from visible necessary connection. <laughs> right. Um, Do I have time to say anything about what the argument is? I mean, I think I can go through it really quickly. So, like, it has um, four steps, basically. Right? But, but I'm not going to write them down. But the first step is that our, our reasons for belief in matters of fact beyond sense, present senses and memory are always an inference from effect to cause. Um, so like this comes from inference from effect to cause. You might think it should be inference from cause to effect, but I don't have time to talk about why it's inference from effect to cause. Maybe I'll talk about that next time. 
Um, then he says, so therefore this presupposes a connection. So this presupposes a connection between effect and cause. <laughs> Great uh, or nexus, as Todd will say. Great, like a, I guess a nexus literally is a, no, is it a knot or is it a, it may not. Anyway, they're, but yeah, they're like tied together. Um, and then number three is this is discovered only by experience. We only discover connections between causes and effects by experience. That's on page, these are all almost on the same page. The first one was page 16. The second is on page 16. The third one is on page 17. <laughs> so this is, I, I'll, I, I'm gonna have to go through this in more detail next time. So, right, so we only discover these by experience. That's again, where he discusses this hard case where you might think we know in advance of experience that one body will push the other. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, Experience, however, provides no reason for believing that there's this, this connection between the effect and the cause. This probably, because um, what kind of reason could it provide? Well, uh, It's not demonstrable. We have a lot of ways of showing it. But perhaps the most interesting one is it says demonstrations work right away or not at all. Right. They don't, you don't, you can't, you can't conclude something from a thousand similar cases that you couldn't conclude from the first one if it's demonstrative. Um, so this kind of learning from experience by having seen them go together over and over can't, is not a possible form of demonstration. But so if so it's not demonstrative, but what's the alternative? So the alternative would be that it's a matter of fact. Right? We find as a matter of fact that whatever we experience happening over and over always continues to happen in the future. But that would be circular, right? Because we've just shown we only know matters of fact by this inference, and this inference is only backed up by this supposed reason. And now this reason is going to be matter of fact. So we're we're going in a circle. So therefore, we have no reason. We have no reason to. We do expect the like effects to follow from the like causes in the future, but we have no reason to expect it. All right, that's it. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Uh,